Having seen the diseases, the types of it, the agents that cause these diseases, the modes how they spread, now let's see how they are treated and how they are prevented from occurring. So this video mainly concentrates on principles of treatment, principles of prevention, etc. So let's first begin with principles of treatment. There are two ways to treat an infectious disease. One would be to reduce the effects of the disease and other to kill the cause of the disease that is the bacteria or virus from which it is being caused. For the first time we can provide treatment that will reduce the symptoms. The symptoms are usually because of inflammation that is caused due to these diseases. For example, we can take medicines that bring down fever, reduce pain or lose motions. We can take bed rest so that we can conserve our energy. This will enable us to have more of it available to focus on healing. But this kind of symptom directed treatment by itself will not make the infecting microbe go away and the disease will not be cured but rather its outcomes will be subdued. For that we need to be able to kill off the microbes. Now how do we do that? One way is to use medicines that kill microbes. They are viruses, bacteria, fungi and protozoa as we had seen earlier. Each of these groups of organisms will have some essential biochemical life process which is peculiar to that group and not shared with other groups. These processes may be pathways for the synthesis of new substances or respiration. These pathways will not be used by us either. For example, our cells make new substances by a mechanism different from that used by the bacteria that causes disease. We have to find a drug that blocks the bacterial synthesis pathway without affecting our own. This is what is achieved by the antibiotics that we are familiar with. Similarly, there are drugs that kill protozoa such as the malarial parasite. One reason why making antiviral medicines is harder than making antibacterial medicines is that viruses have few biochemical mechanisms of their own. They enter our cells and use our machinery for their life processes. That is, they are dependent on our cells for their living. This means that there are relatively few virus specific targets to aim at. Despite this limitation, there are now effective antiviral drugs, for example, the drugs that keep HIV uh, infection under control. Moving forward, now let's see principles of prevention. All of what we have talked about so far deals with how to get rid of an infection in, in someone who has the disease. But what are the three limitations of this approach to dealing with infectious disease? The first limitation is that once someone has a disease, their body functions are damaged and may, may never recover completely. The second is that treatment will take time which means that some time suffering from a disease is likely to be bedridden for some time even if we can pr give proper treatment. The third uh, limitation is that the person suffering from an infectious disease can serve as the source from where the infection may spread to other people. This leads to the multiplication of above difficulties. It is because of such reasons that prevention of disease is better than cure. It is a famous saying as well. There are two ways to prevent diseases, one general and one specific to each disease. The general ways of preventing infections mostly related to preventing exposure. For airborne microbes, we can prevent exposure by providing living conditions that are not overcrowded. For waterborne microbes, we can prevent exposure by providing safe drinking water. This can be done by treating the water to kill any microbial contamination. For vector bone infections, we can provide clean environments. This would not, for example, allow mosquito breeding. In other words, public hygiene is one basic key to prevention of infectious diseases. Normally, we are faced with infections every day. If someone is suffering from cold and cough in the class, it is likely that children sitting around will be exposed to the infection. 
but all of them do not actually suffer from diseases. It is seen that only few, maybe one or two, get affected by this. This is because the immune system of our body is normally fighting off microbes. We have cells that specialize in killing infecting by microbes. These cells go into action each time infecting microbes enter the body. If they are successful, we do not actually come down with any disease. The immune cells manage to kill off the infection long before it assumes major proportions and cause a disease. As we noted earlier, if the number of infecting microbes is controlled, the manifestations of disease will be very minor. In other words, becoming exposed or infected with an infectious microbe does not necessarily mean developing noticeable disease. One way of looking at severe infectious disease is that it represents a lack of success of immune system. The person who gets infected by the disease has a weak immune system. The functioning of the immune system like any other system in our body will not be good if proper and sufficient nourishment of food is not available. Therefore, the second basic principle of prevention of infectious disease is the availability of proper and sufficient food for everyone. Now let's take an example of smallpox. If you had smallpox once, there was no chance of suffering from it again. So, Having the disease once was a means of preventing subsequent attacks of the same disease. This happens because when the immune system first sees an infectious microbe, it responds against it and then remembers it specifically. So the next time that same particular microbe or its close relative enter the body, the immune system responds with even greater strength. This eliminates the infection even more quickly than the first time. This is the basis of the principle of vaccination has come into our usage. We can now see that as a general principle, we can literally fool the immune system into developing a memory for a particular infection by putting something that mimics the microbe we want to vaccinate against into our body. This does not actually cause the disease, but this would prevent any subsequent exposure to the infecting microbe from turning into actual disease. Many such vaccines are now available for preventing a whole range of infectious disease and provide a disease-specific means of prevention. There are vaccines against tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, polio and many others. Some hepatitis viruses which cause jaundice are transmitted through water. There is a vaccine for one of them, hepatitis A, in the market. But the majority of children in many parts of India are already immune to Hepatitis A by the time they are 5 years old. This is because they are exposed to the virus through water. Hence, we saw how memory developed inside the immune system helps in preventing a particular kind of disease from happening again. So in this video, we saw the principles of treatment, the principles of prevention, and also we saw how immune system develops a memory in order to stop the disease from happening again. With this, I end the chapter on why do we fall ill. Thank you.